I've got a presentation put together today, but you're certainly welcome to ask questions. I'm gonna go over a little bit about what real estate actually is, what um, uh, skills you need to do it, what the job is actually like, both selling and appraising, more selling, since that's what more people are interested in. And then I will also give you all the information for how to get your license, what it costs, things like that. At the end, um, I have a bunch of links to the, um, the associations and the places to uh, get the information about the license and all that. And I will be sharing my PowerPoint with the library so they can set it all off to you. So you will have all those links, okay? <laughs> Go ahead and feel free to put questions in chat. I'll try to get to them. Uh, some of the library staff may help me take a look at them also, but, um, um, and sometimes I may not get to them right away. I may wait until they are, uh, until I'm at a point where the question uh, makes sense with the presentation, all right? So let's start off here. Um, as Leah mentioned, I am a realtor. I'm a certified residential real property appraiser, which means I'm, I'm an appraiser. There are four different license levels. I'm the, the third uh, license level. Uh, I do residential property. The only license level higher than that is um, a commercial appraiser, and I don't do commercial uh, stuff. And I am an instructor. I've been teaching classes for years because for both those licenses, you need education every um, year, every licensing cycle to keep up your license. The same thing is true for your hairdresser and um, all kinds of other careers. And so I teach a lot of those classes. Um, and uh, for some reason I became a measuring expert. <laughs> um, uh, one of the classes I teach is how to measure a home. Uh, realtors need to know how big the house is when they put it in MLS. As an appraiser, I have to measure every house. I have to put a sketch of every house and every appraisal. And uh, so I do hundreds of them every year. And most realtors don't sell 100 houses a year, but I definitely appraise uh, over 100 houses a year. I used to when I was doing more appraisals. Um, so I started teaching realtors how to measure, and now I measure houses for a living. It's kind of kind of fun and stress-free. Uh, so I, I have a variety of experience throughout the business. Um, one thing I want to point out first, if you'll notice, realtor is a registered trademark. Uh, it's actually a trade association. You can be a real estate agent and not be a realtor, but once you belong to the National Association of Realtors, you become a realtor, and that's why it's printed that way with a capital letter. They printed it in all caps uh, with a registered trademark, and it is just a two-syllable word. It's just realtor. So, all right. So, why is there so much interest in real estate? Right now, partly it's the economic shakeup. Whenever the economy starts getting in flux and people are losing the jobs and they're starting to realize they don't like their job and things like that, a lot of people look to real estate. It always looks like a glamorous, easy job. It looks like you have tons of freedom. Um, it looks like you can make a ton of money. And it's definitely something that people are drawn to. Uh, and back in uh, 2006 or so, people were joining like crazy again. Okay, people were taking classes and signing up and becoming realtors fast and furious back then when the pricing of houses was going up again. And then after the market crash, tons of people just dropped out. A lot of appraisers dropped out. Uh, we lost about a third of the appraisers after the housing crash, um, partly because of the crash and partly because of the backlash of new laws and regulations that came in. Most appraisers are pretty old and they just said, forget it, we're getting out of business. So real estate definitely fluctuates a lot with the economy, uh, partly because it's easy to get into and it's easy to get out of and you can do it part-time. Um, plus it, um, it always sounds like a good job and it hits the news. So if anybody's unsatisfied with their current job, especially people who are, don't feel safe in their jobs right now because of the pandemic, you have much more control in real estate. Yeah, you're still gonna see people and you're gonna go into other people's houses, but it's not eight hours a day standing on your feet with you know, customers constantly coming up to your window and getting food from you. Uh, so uh, a lot of people are getting into it again right now. Uh, and whenever something's in the news, it sounds it gets a lot more attention. And real estate's been in the news a lot in the last couple of years. Definitely uh, right now with the crazy rate that prices are going up. Um, there is a housing shortage in different markets around the country, but most markets around the country, there are very few homes uh, compared to how many people want a home. From the Cato Institute in California, California, first of all, prices are crazy. California has a median sale price 2.5 times higher than the national average. 2.5 times higher than the national average. 
just below 1 million in the San Francisco Bay Area. So that's um, single family homes. So that includes the uh, condos and townhomes and stuff like that. But in comparison to that $1 million price range, almost 58% of counties nationwide have a median home price of less than $150,000. So go from a million to more than half the country, the median price is $150,000. So it's a crazy swing. But the reason California is so high is the housing shortage. Um, California has fewer housing units per capita than any other state except for Utah as of January 2021. Estimates are that between 1 million to 3.5 million um, short, uh, units short. So people are willing to pay anything. In the town I live in, I live in a little community and uh, I was on a phone call, uh, the Zoom call with um, city council and there was somebody on that call who wanted to live in our town and there was literally only one house for sale at that moment. And he was asking if he could buy commercial property and turn it into residential property right on Main Street. And um, because commercial property is vacant right now, a lot of it's vacant. There are a lot of stores that are open, a lot of restaurants that are open, our movie theater closed. And he wants to change that into residential. That's how desperate he is to live in our town and how desperate he is to find the property. Right now, houses are going up on the market. Most realtors will put a house on the market these days, Friday afternoon. They will allow showings all day Saturday and Sunday in 15 minute increments and people are just going through the house like crazy. And then they take all the offers uh, by Monday at noon or Monday 5 p.m. And they'll be sifting through 28 offers, 40 offers. And some of them are $50,000, $350,000 above the listing price. And people are crazy about it. They are foregoing any in, uh, inspections on the home. Usually when you buy a house, you have an inspector come through and take a look at it and make sure that the foundation's okay, that the furnace is working and they're foregoing all that. Um, cash is king right now because most of these houses will not appraise for the values that they're offering on them. And so they won't be able to get a loan. So people are coming in with cash offers. Now, of course, there are a lot of people in the world that have plenty of money to just throw down cash on a house but other people are taking out a mortgage on their current home or taking out money from their retirement funds, buying the house with cash. And then as soon as they move in, they refinance it, get a mortgage and put the money back where it went. But cash is the only way they can get houses. So since real estate's in the news, people are asking about getting into the business. And because with COVID-19, so many people were so devastated by the economy, but realtors are making a killing. They are not all of them, of course, but a lot of them are making just a ton of money during all this. Um, plus, public perception is always that realtors are rich. <laughs> uh, most realtors are not rich. Uh, most realtors are part-time. Most realtors don't work, I was going to say don't work that hard, but um, there's a wide variety of what people make, okay? By the way, I'm just going to check some messages here, see if there's any questions. So sometimes if you see my mouse moving around, I'm just moving some menus out of the way and things like that. All right. Oh, there's one question that comes in here asking me to be uh, look at my crystal ball. <clears throat> um, what do you see as the future of housing in the Bay? Uh, do you think it will shift to more large multifamily? Um, it's always difficult to tell where things are going to go. But nationwide over the last several years, houses have gotten smaller and smaller and smaller, and they've started to get bigger again. Uh, right now, a lot of the reason that people are moving is because they suddenly need a house that has office space for one or two adults. They suddenly need a space that has um, schoolroom space for the kids. And more and more people are going um, uh, private, right? They're gonna have everything there. Um, more of the big houses people are buying, they're moving out of their small houses, moving into the big houses. And so many of these big houses now have full gyms and sport courts with two story high ceilings where they can play basketball and hockey and everything else in there so they don't have to go to a gym anymore. Um, and part of the reason that people are very interested in real estate is the HGTV syndrome, that's what I call it. Um, HGTV has so many shows about real estate and they all make it look so easy. Let's show somebody these four houses and they'll instantly buy one and everything's perfect. Well, they've already seen those houses. They already offered one. They already moved all their stuff in. That's already their house by the time you see the show. Um, and so much of the information on those shows is entertainment and not real life. Okay, you bought a house for $600,000 and you put in $20,000 and you got a whole new kitchen and a new doorway and a new uh, roof and remodeled the entire thing for $20,000 and now you're going to sell it for a $300,000 profit? No, you're not. So, so 
uh, a lot of people's, uh, there are a lot of industries where the general public thinks they know more than the professionals about it. And real estate is definitely one of them because of HGTV. Um, and so that can be a frustrating part of it, but it also gets more and more people interested in real estate. They see it, they think they know everything and they try to get into the business. So um, that's part of the reason that there's a lot of activity right now um, as far as people trying to get into the business. It doesn't mean you shouldn't. Oh, and one of the reason also is it's very easy to get in. Um, realtors are independent contractors. You have your own business. And usually if you're going to start your own business, you need to buy a whole bunch of inventory and get a retail shop and uh, set a million things up. In real estate, you don't. You take a test, you, you pass it, you're in. It doesn't take much to get in. Maybe get some business cards. You don't even really need those these days. You got a smartphone, you're done. So it's a very easy industry to get into, very inexpensive to have your own business to get into it. So that's why a lot of people are in it part-time because why not? All right. Um, by the way, I was talking about increasing values. Uh, notice these values here in the um, San Francisco Bay area. In last month, the average price was 1.51 million. Now it's 1.225, one month later. Prices are going nuts. And this is what it was a year ago. Just, just over 1 million, now it's 1.25. So prices are going up crazy. This is the year to year change. Uh, so here's a 20, almost a 24% change there. Los Angeles, 22% change. Central Coast, 26% change. I mean, the, the prices are nuts. So, um, and again, that's part of the reason it hits the news. All right, so if you're thinking about getting into real estate, is it gonna be your business or is it gonna be your hobby? Whether it's a business or a hobby, you need to treat it the same way. You need to treat it like a business for a couple of reasons. Partly because real estate is uh, guided by a lot of federal laws, of a lot of federal regulations. Um, so you have some liability, quite a bit of liability regarding uh, discrimination as well as a lot of other things. We all carry insurance for it. So even if you want to get into real estate to sell a couple of houses here and there, you still need to make sure that you treat it like a business. One of those ways is to talk to your financial planner, talk to your tax accountant, and figure out how you're going to handle your money. As I mentioned, you are going to be an independent contractor. There are almost no um, employees in real estate. Most Everybody has to work under a broker. You become a real estate agent, you become a realtor, and you have to work under a broker. Now, a broker could be a huge company with offices everywhere, national offices, uh, and employ millions of, or, and have millions of independent contractors under them. Or it could be one person that you know nearby who got their broker's license, and they're going to hold your license for you. So it, it could be a small company or a big company, but they're, most realtors are not employees. Okay. We'll keep going. Um, so make sure you talk to your financial planner because you are not going to be receiving a, 10, uh, a W-2 anymore. You need to set up a business for yourself to make sure that your taxes are taken care of, to make sure that, um, that you're handling your money correctly. Get a separate bank account for your business. Again, you're not going to be getting a W-2, so this is not just income. This is, this is business income. It's separate, and it doesn't cost much to get a separate um, uh, bank account. Plenty easy to do. Set it up separately. Um, you should come up with a, uh, you don't have to come up with a company name, but uh, you can check with the local uh, commerce department to, to find out what names are taken, but get yourself a separate bank account. All your money goes into there so it doesn't get commingled with your personal funds that are coming from other jobs or from, uh, uh, from the family. Also, if you are not getting a W-2, nobody's taking taxes out of your paychecks. You need to start handling your taxes. You need to start putting money aside. Uh, most realtors pay quarterly taxes. So you need to be prepared for that. So what a lot of people do is take uh, every paycheck, every time you get a commission check, they take every check and take a chunk out, out of it out and put it in a separate account to be ready to go. Um, I have money every month just out of my bank account, just automatically transferred over to uh, a savings account. So it's in there ready to go. Um, I was on a Facebook page today and uh, one person said she puts 40% of every single commission check in a separate account. And then she's got it ready there for her taxes, for any surprise expenses and for, um, uh, savings. 
So you need to start being responsible for that. Keep in mind that you are now running a business. It's not just going to work and coming home when your boss is taking care of other things. You need to think about a budget also. When you run your own business, everything that you spend needs to be kept track of. You need to figure out how much money you're actually making. Make sure that's, that the job is worth it to you, that you're going to make enough money. You do need to spend some money on advertising. That varies greatly. Um, uh, certain things are tax deductible. That is not in my department. <laughs> but talk to your, your tax accountant about what's tax deductible and what's not. But you need to start thinking about a budget, making sure that, that you're not wasting money and coming out with no actual uh, profit at the end. So start thinking about that. Start thinking about where you can spend money, where you can save money, and what you're actually going to have to spend on it. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the things that that does that do cost you money in here. Um, by the way, part of why you get a separate bank account is so you have a separate corporate credit card. Okay, I have a corporate credit card, and everything for my business goes on that credit card. So at the end of the year, I don't even have to think about where I spent money or what it was for. It's all for my business, so it makes it super easy for there. Uh, get a professional email address. Please don't use your, you know, hotchick94 at gmail.com for your business. Get a, sp a special email address for it. They're cheap. They're free. If you're going to use Gmail, um, it's very cheap to get one with your own name on it. Um, I've got several uh, professional emails. One of them is just my Zoe. Zoe well, it's just my, my name. Um, and that is not a bad idea to get one that is going to be permanent. Some people are still using AOL email addresses, which make them look kind of funny and unprofessional. But if you've ever changed your email address, you know that it's hard to get everybody to follow you because their computers still autofill the one that uh, from years ago. And it's very hard to get people transferred over. A lot of realtors, every every real estate company, if you when you work under a broker, will hand you an email address. Okay, It's usually your name uh, at theircompany.com. The problem is most realtors go to at least three companies during their lifetime. They switch brokerages. And if you are at, you know, abcrealty.com for years and then you want to switch to XYZ Realty, a ton of your people are never going to get the news. They're never going to update their email contact list. And they're always going to be emailing at the wrong email and you're going to lose a bunch of people. So set yourself up with your own email address that you will never lose people through and make it a professional one. Make it, you know, responsible name. Also change the greeting on your phone or get a second line. Um, a lot of, uh, you can set your cell phone up to get have two different phone numbers coming into it so you know how to answer it when it comes in. And so you can have a second greeting on that. Um, uh, but make it professional. That way, if you answer it at 10 o'clock at night, then you know how to answer the phone. Um, and here's the thing about uh business or hobby, full-time versus part-time. A lot of the full-time realtors try to shame the people who are in it part-time. That's not necessary. You can be part-time and still be a really good realtor. You just need to make sure that you stay up to date on everything. One of the great things about this business is that you can do it until the day you die because you don't have to show up every day. You can decide how often you work, how little you work, how much you work. Uh, I had a realtor friend that I've known forever. Um, he died about a year and a half ago. He was 82. He was still working. I helped him with a lot of things at that point. He wasn't so great at technology, so I would help him do a lot of the technology stuff. Um, he was pretty darn good at it, but I would still help him with things. And he was getting uh, hard to move around a little bit, so two-story homes were tough for him. So full-time or part-time, you can do the job well, but just make sure you do not fall out of it being in touch with what's happening in the business because rules change, laws change, traditions change, uh, the market fluctuates. Just keep yourself informed. And that's easy enough to do. Uh, there are a lot of Facebook pages for realtors, for appraisers, and they're fascinating and incredibly educational to hear about what other people are doing, how people are filling out purchase agreements, um, what new laws came about. Your broker should keep you in touch also. Uh, most brokers have weekly meetings. They're all done on Zoom now. That will let you know about law changes. So you can still be a part-time realtor and be good. As I was mentioning, my friend who uh, died recently at 82, he was still in the business and he was still doing a good job. He only sold a couple of homes a year, but still a couple of homes a year, a couple thousand dollars, not a bad part-time job well into your retirement age, right? A lot of other people who are retired and want to keep working are, you know, working cashier at a store and that's hard and you don't have any freedom. 
So it's an excellent business for the long term. Um, also, you can get referral business in real estate. So if I have someone come to me and uh, they say, hey, we want to use you as a realtor, but we live 100 miles away and say, well, I'm not going to be your realtor because I wouldn't be able to represent you well. But I know Bob. He works in your area. He'll take good care of you. I call up Bob. I say, Bob, you can have these people if you give me 20%, 25% of your commission. Boom. I make 20, 25% for a phone call. Bob's happy to get the business. My people are taken care of. It's all good. There are people who later in their lives or at a different time in their life, they got stuff going on. They still have contacts. They still have a database. They still have people calling them, but they aren't able to do the work right then. They refer it out and they still get paychecks for handing off business to other people. So it's a great business, even if you're part-time. All right, just make sure that you stay up to date on everything. <clears throat> All right. Okay, so one of the things you have to decide when you get into the business is where, where are you going to hold your license? Which bro broker are you going to choose? There are a lot of things to consider here. I can't tell you everything, and I can't tell you exactly how every broker works. But there are brokers who will split a commission with you where you get a certain commission, they take a certain percentage of it. That's how most brokers work. Some brokers will take a huge percent of it. Some brokers will take up to 50% of each one of your commissions. Other brokers will take a lot less. What most of them do is take a big percent at the beginning of every year and say they'll start at like 50% in January. And by the time you make enough commissions that they've got $30,000 out of your commissions, then you can get 90% of your commission. Okay, so they're all different. And when you go sit down with a broker, you need to take notes and then you're gonna have to work out some math because it's hard to keep track of exactly how much money you're gonna make. But in a company like that, that switches over at the beginning of every year, you gotta make a lot of sales at the beginning of the year to make sure that you're gonna uh, get enough commissions at the end of the year. Um, uh, and if you're not gonna do a whole lot of transactions every year, and a lot of people don't, that's not the kind of broker to go with because then you will never get above getting 50%. Um, we used to have, and they're not very common anymore, um, desk fees, where I worked for a company for a while where I got 100% of my commission, but I paid a monthly rental for my desk. Well, now most offices don't even have desks anymore. Most offices don't even exist. So that doesn't really exist anymore, but at least I had a budget then where it was my monthly fee, I knew exactly how much it was. So regardless of what I sold. Um, so if I sold a lot that year, I made much more profit. If I didn't sell very much, well, at least I had a budget and I knew exactly how much I had to pay every year and I didn't end up losing more commissions. Most brokers have transaction fees. Um, and that is a, a, a certain amount of money that comes off of each transaction that you do. So uh, it's usually off of each side. So if I represent a seller and I have a transaction fee, I pay this $400 to my broker every time I work with the seller. If I have a seller and a buyer on the same house, I'll pay that $400 twice, once for the buyer and once for the seller, because that's two different sides. Um, but check with brokers and see if they have transaction fees. Those are nice little things, because again, it's a, it's a budgetable. You can figure it out how many sides you're going to do and how much it's going to cost you. And it's not based on... Uh, commissions not based on percentages. It's a more regulated fee, so it's easier to figure it out there. Uh, some brokers will let you charge the client that, and some you have to pay it. Also check with your brokers. Real estate is a kind of a crazy business where once you get your license, go sell a house. There's no regulations on how you could go out the day you get your license and sell a $3 million house. And without any real life training. Because the licensing training is how to get your license. <laughs> the courses that you take are about laws and about definitions and about ethics and things like that. But none of it teaches you how to use any computers. None of it teaches you how to deal with your clients. None of it teaches you how to advertise. None of it teaches you how to open a lockbox to get into the house. That's the th those are things that you need to learn on the job. But a lot of brokers do have fantastic training to help the new agents get up and going. Now, they will take more of your money up front, but it's just paying for training. Um, so check with your broker, especially if you're new. Do they have training? Do they have mentors? Do they have classes? Um, uh, 
I teach a lot of classes for some of these uh, brokers where I go in to their meetings and give them an hour class about this, an hour class about that. Um, a lot of them uh, require them to go to our association where they can get certain classes that they have to take. Um, but check with your broker about that. Some brokers are great on support and other ones are not uh, great on support. My current broker is a smaller brokerage. Uh, lease expired on the building about two years ago. And so he just gave up the building. He doesn't need it anymore. But I switched over to him from my other broker where I was paying a desk fee. I started out at one of the big companies that you pay a lot of, you pay half your commission and they give you lots of really formal training. And they were a big company with a well-known name. Um, and I got a lot of business just for being with them. Then I switched to the other company where I was more on my own and I paid my desk fee. And so I had that budgeted out and I had an office there and I went to work every day. And then for the last, I don't know how many years, I've been with a smaller broker that doesn't even have uh, weekly meetings like the other ones, doesn't get in your business, doesn't deal with you much, but you have to have a certain amount of experience before you come work with him. And he's much more hands off. So there's lots of different options there. He's got no training, nothing like that. If I have a question, I can call him. He's still my broker. He's still the one that um, uh, is responsible for me in the end. Uh, but I get more money for each deal because he doesn't have to provide those things for me. And now that he's not even providing an office, he actually dropped our rates. I pay him um, just a monthly fee, which is very low. Honestly, it's on auto pay. I don't know what it is right now. It's crazy low. It's like a hundred bucks or something. I mean, he dropped that when he got rid of the office. Uh, and then I pay a transaction fee every time I do a deal. So that works for me because I don't sell a million houses anymore um, because I do so many other things. So talk to the brokers and figure out that there's lots of different options out there and figure out what's going to work best for you. When you're new, you're probably going to want to go with one of those bigger names that offer you a lot of training, offer you mentors, maybe even have an office that you can still go into so you can casually ask people questions. It does help to have other agents around to talk to. But I highly recommend getting on some of the Facebook pages also. Even if you never ask a question, just read every day and you'll learn so much. Then you could also think about, are you an independent kind of person or do you want to work on a team? Most realtors are independent realtors. They are um, uh, they show up, they do all their own stuff, they take care of everything. Uh, some of the offices will enter your listing when you get a house that you want to sell. They will enter it into the computer system, into MLS, the multiple listing system for you. But other than that, they do everything on themse themselves. They ad advertise, they buy all their supplies on their own, they work on their own, they don't have anybody else helping them. That's how most agents work. And I think a lot of people get into the business because they like that. They're tired of being bossed around. They're tired of having to depend on other people. I know years ago, um, I worked for a hotel chain and part of me loved it. It was so much fun. I was fresh out of college. So were a lot of the other people there. It was lively. It was active. Um, but man, the day I quit my job where it depended on whether or not other people showed up for work, whew, that was a happy day. <laughs> when I didn't have to worry about who was going to show up. Um, I worked in a, a a lot of my employees were from a not so nice area and more than once the police would show up and try to arrest people, my staff, while I was working. And that was just nerve wracking to not know how your day was going to be the next day because you didn't know who was going to show up for work. So being independent, a lot of people love it. Um, there are other people where that's not your personality type or you don't want to uh, be responsible for absolutely everything. There are real estate teams out there. And sometimes it's two different realtors who work well together and just decided to team up so that somebody could cover for you on a Sunday if you want to take the day off. Uh, there are a lot of family teams. Um, I, I do a lot of work for, uh, uh, I've known the mother forever. She's been in real estate forever. She was an airplane pilot, but, but um, uh, at 9-11, she gave up flying and uh, got into real estate. And uh, then her daughter joined her recently and her daughter is fantastic. Her, the mother knows more about real estate. The daughter knows about social media marketing and uh, they have just blossomed in this huge business. And then um, the cousin, the nephew, so the mother's brother's son now joined them also. And so a lot of times it's family teams that get together. So if you have a family member in real estate or a family member that might wanna get into it, that's something worth thinking about. Um, and teams can be two people or they can be an entire 
office of 12 people. There are some realtors who their name is like the banner name. And then they have buyer's agents that they go out and meet with the buyers and drive them around to the different houses or go meet them at the houses. Uh, there are, they have uh, a marketing person. They have a social media person. They have uh, the office administrator that does all the computer work for them. Uh, they have a, what's very common is a transaction coordinator. Very often realtors get into the business, decide it's too much for them, and they end up becoming transaction coordinators. This is somebody who is really well organized and likes serving people. And they say, okay, we got your house sold. We need these eight pieces of paper from you. We need these things signed. I need to get this off to the loan officer. I need to get this off to the inspector. I need to get this off to the appraiser. I need to get this off to the homeowners association. And they organize all that paperwork. As a realtor, when you sell a property, your evening is shot. Your next day is shot because suddenly you have to get all this information out to a million different people and start coordinating things. And if you can hand that off to somebody else who's got a system and got a checklist and loves that kind of detail, it can free you up to go get the next bit of business. Realtors have to be salespeople. And the less time they spend doing other business, the more they can sell. That's one of the reasons I measure houses for realtors. It's something they should do. They don't really know how, uh, but it's something that takes time and they're better off not figuring that out and worrying about that and um, trying to get good at it when they should be out selling houses. So, so you can be on a team that is 20 people strong with lots of different realtors and lots of different positions like a regular business, or you can be um, with just one or two other people. Figure out what works for you figure out what works in your personality, and you will probably change over the time that you're working. Um, I have uh, worked with other agents where we're not officially a team, but um, a friend of mine that we became friends, she's another realtor, we've rehabbed homes together um, and things like that. When she's out of the country, I cover for her. When I'm on vacation, she covers for me. And um, we can help each other out. It's nothing official, but we figure out payment back and forth and it works out great. You also need to think about your boundaries. There are a lot of agents who get completely burned out. It's an industry where there's a high amount of divorce because the business takes 24 hours a day. You're, there's no such thing as bankers hours for realtors. Your clients are the general public. They're not other businesses. Your clients want you available at all times and they will call you at all times. I had a client that used to text me at 4 a.m. all the time. Now, not too bad since pre-pandemic, I was usually up by 4.15, but still I didn't want to deal with business 15 minutes before my alarm clock was going off. And then when I was on vacation, it was going off at 2 a.m. instead of 4 a.m. That was really bad. I just switched her to whenever she calls or texts, it doesn't make a sound. Um, she didn't want answers right then. She was just up and wanted me to put her thoughts on paper to make sure she had all the questions asked. Uh, I know an agent. Um, uh, he's a very organized person. He actually, when he got in the business, he hired me to work with him and I taught him everything. I would go to all his appointments with him. I taught him all the computer business, all the computer programs he needed. Um, he's a very detailed, organized, disciplined person. And on his voicemail, it tells you what hours he will accept phone calls and what hours um, he is not available. He's got kids and he wants to have a life. And so he doesn't accept phone calls on Sundays. He won't answer text messages on Sundays. And I think it's 7 p.m. is his limit. Some agents say you have to be available at all times. Other agents manage to have a life as long as they set expectations for their clients. So be strong, figure out what works for you. If you're a high energy agent and you love the activity and you want to hear from somebody at midnight, that's fine. But take care of yourself. Make sure that if you are not that kind of person, that you figure out how to turn your phone off, you figure out how to set expectations without getting mad at your clients um, and figure it out there. Uh, <clears throat> uh, there, when I used to work for an employer, I used to get cranky if I was asked to work overtime. It's like, oh, he's making me work. I don't want to work. I got other things to do. 
when it's you doing it and you're working overtime and you make more money because you're working overtime, it's easier to work overtime and you're happier to do it. Um, uh, when I'm appraising, I will often work until one or two in the morning because I get engr engrossed in the project that I'm working on. <coughs> Excuse me. And I enjoy it so much that the time flies by and I don't mind it at all. So you may not mind being super busy. Maybe you're working a regular nine to five job right now. And if you get into real estate, you're working till midnight and you're totally fine with that. If you're loving what you're doing, go with it. Just realize that you are in control and you can run the business any way that you want. All right. Okay. <laughs> so talking about some of the good stuff and some of the bad stuff, as I mentioned the general public kind of thinks real estate is all just glamour and fun and uh, driving around and seeing pretty houses. And believe me, part of it is that I get to see some fantastic properties. Uh, so much fun. Um, I love going off to see the houses. I like being the tour guide when I'm working with buyers, going out and showing them things and talking to them about it. Um, um, my specialty is first time home buyers. And part of that is because I like to teach people things, <coughs> excuse me. So I like talking to them about the entire process and working them through it and explaining things to them and going to a house and telling them why this is here and what that pipe is for and you know why the smoke detector isn't attached and things like that. Um, I enjoy that. Going out and looking at the houses is the fun part. Uh, when I first got into the business and I got away from being locked in a building all day, it was fantastic to be part of your job, get in a car and drive around and meet people and see fun houses. So if you're tired of being locked up, <coughs> excuse me, um, it can definitely be fun. You do see some horrifying, creepy, disgusting places also. Depends on what price range you're in and, and things like that. Um, uh, <laughs> so you don't always get to see just mansions. I have certainly been in some um, disgusting, nasty houses. Um, yeah, so I was, I was prepared for the pandemic because I already owned plastic gloves <coughs> and I already owned shoe covers and I already carried sanitizer solution and hand wipes in my car. It's kind of shocking how many people have never cleaned a light switch in their house. You go in, you turn on the light and you're like, oh, I don't want to touch my hand to anything again. Um, so, uh, um, and as I mentioned, part of the good part is that you run your own business. You get to make your decisions. You get to decide, am I going to sell 20 houses this year? Or am I just going to sell five? Do I want to grow my business so I sell 40 houses a year? Or am I okay sticking to five? Do I want to work mostly with buyers? Or do I want to work mostly with sellers? Do I want to work only in this one neighborhood? Do I want to work all over this huge area and drive an hour for my clients every day? It is totally up to you within ethical guidelines and, and things like that, uh, how you run your business. By the way, I mentioned the ethical guidelines because one of the ethics that you have to agree to is that you will not accept a job for an area or a kind of property that you don't know how to do, okay? Uh, so if you're selling residential real estate and somebody asks you to sell their restaurant, you probably shouldn't do it. Uh, you can always team up with another realtor who knows how to do it and you can learn it, right? You have to be able to expand what you know how to do, but you have to do that by getting uh, somebody else to teach you it or, or admit it to your client and figure out how to learn it before, you're, uh, bef uh, before you sell the property. Um, but you get to decide because it's your own business. You get to make the decision. So that's a fantastic thing. You can take unlimited vacation time. There are a lot of people who disappear for a solid month every year. Some of them disappear for two months every year. Some people disappear for three months every year. Um, you can, you don't have to fight with the boss about, I only get two weeks of vacation, that's crazy. You can go on vacation anytime you want. And I've been in business long enough uh, that it was pre-cell phone. <laughs> so it was much harder to go on vacation uh, before the cell phone. Uh, earlier on with one of my first cell phones, I was doing mostly appraising then just selling a couple houses a year. And this is when I got appraisals uh, through, uh, through faxes. So if I left home, it would be really hard to get my orders from my clients. Well, I had an apprentice under me and um, I had all my faxes come through my cell phone. I didn't know the cell phone could do this, except for one day I checked my message and it said you had three messages and a fax. I was like, how do I have a fax on my phone? That you can get at the time, I don't know if you still can, um, 
at the time I could get faxes on my phone. It would tell me I had a, a, a fax and it said, what number would you like to transfer it to? And I just go down to the hotel on vacation and go to the front desk and say, I got a fax. Can I send it to you? And they print it out and charge me for it. And then I would call my apprentice at home and say, hey, got an order for you. Can you do this? So I could be out of town and my clients never knew because of my cell phone. And that is still the case. Um, uh, but even back when it orders, uh, obviously you can't show houses when you're out of town, but you can still do a lot of business. Everything is done remotely. Even pre-COVID, you can do all your paperwork and everything remotely. So you can go on vacation. And even, I don't tend to take a whole lot of big vacations. I don't disappear for a month. I don't, I, I haven't been to Europe in years, but I go on those daily vacations. If you'll notice my backdrop, <laughs> it's kayaking on a lake. Um, if I don't have any appointments and tomorrow's going to be 80 degrees and sunny, I might just disappear to the lake for the day. And at some point I will pull over for lunch and check my messages and my clients still think I'm working. And I am, I'm still checking my messages. So I don't go on those big vacations where I take huge chunks of times, but I take hours on certain days. I take a whole day if it's fantastic. I disappear for an hour with my dogs every afternoon during work hours because they need a walk and I don't have a boss telling me I can't do it. So it can be very, very flexible. People with kids, you can go to every event. You can you know, volunteer at school. You can be home if they're sick. You can make it work for you. Okay. Now the people who don't do a good job of making it work for you, because most clients want to see houses at night, um, they can still schedule it and make it work for them, but sometimes they just get overwhelmed and say yes to every single client. So make sure you aren't one of those people, but you can determine your own schedule and you can make a ton of money. There are plenty of agents who make over a million dollars a year, no problem. Well, not no problem, they're working hard. Um, but you have to do work to do it. You have to make sure you're organized to do it. But it is definitely a business where it is unlimited. If your clientele is all people who are buying uh, small houses without, for not much money, you're going to work a lot harder for your money than somebody who's all your clientele is a couple million dollars because you are getting paid on a percentage base, basis. But you can determine that. As I mentioned, the flexible hours. Um, in appraising, when I was doing mostly appraising every day, I, I basically worked on a split schedule. I would go off and do all my appointments in the morning. And then the afternoon I would have it free. I'd go out to lunch with friends. I'd walk the dogs and enjoy the sunshine. And then about 6 p.m. I'd be back at my computer till about midnight. And that was a schedule that worked for me. So you make it work for you. You're not tied to a desk, like I mentioned before, to be able to get out and see the daylight and see the sunshine and not have to be locked up is fantastic. Um, you get to pick your clients. If there's somebody you don't get along with, fire them. Don't work with them. You don't have a boss telling you you have to. If somebody's creepy, don't work with them. If somebody's annoying and too demanding, refer them to somebody else and take part of the commission and don't work with them. And you do get to meet some fantastic people. I have a lot of friends that I met because I sold them a house. Um, and it can be a lot of fun. And especially because you're working with big decisions with them. So you get to know them pretty well. Oh, and here's some of the bad stuff. It's a job. Like any other job, there's crap that you got to do that you don't want to do. <laughs> That's not the fun part. And you got to get it done and it interferes. And sometimes you got to stay up late. Uh, so it is a job and you've got to treat it like a job. Again, there are federal guidelines and regulations that are, uh, that are guiding you and people do sue, sue realtors and appraisers sometimes. So you have to treat it professionally also. Uh, the good part is you run your own business. The bad part is you run your own business. You are the advertising department. You are the accountant. You are the accounts receivable. Uh, you are the schedule, you're everything, okay? Unless you're working on those big teams. So you need to know more. You need to pay attention to more. You don't, you're not going to spend all your time selling. Uh, and even though you can take unlimited vacation time, none of them are paid. You're not getting a paycheck coming in while you're gone. You're not being paid for those days off, right? If I take time off, I'm well aware that I'm not earning something that day. Uh, so, think about that. You also don't get benefits, right? There's no health insurance. Uh, through the National Association of Realtors, you can get some, but you don't get any of the regular benefits. No 401k set up for you, nothing like that. You're not working for a big company. Um, and as I said, you must be selling every day. Real estate is a sales job. Uh, it's a person-to-person -person sales job, not person-to-business. So you're not knocking on business doors and trying to meet with the marketing manager every day. But you need to let people know that you're in real estate. Some people do it 
annoyingly and bug all their friends. Um, other people don't. <laughs> um, but every time you sell a house, you lost a client. They're probably not going to buy another one for at least a couple of years. So you need to get new clients all the time. So you're trying to service the clients you've got and trying to get their contracts done and everything else, but you just got to make sure you have other ones in your pipeline. So if you hate selling, not the job for you. There's a lot of competition out there. Everybody you know probably knows a realtor. There's over 4,000 agents in San Francisco alone. Okay. So there are a lot of realtors out there. Now, most of those agents are probably not selling a whole lot of houses every year, but still everybody knows somebody. So you've got some competition. As I said, you have to follow the law. There are real consequences if you do not. Oh, there's by no benefits and no health insurance. Um, and by the way, you may meet some good people. Some people are freaking crazy. <laughs> um, residential real estate is an emotional business. Commercial, not so much. Commercial real estate, if you're going to sell that, and I don't sell commercial real estate, but people are there to make the money. They're running the numbers, make sure they can make a profit off of it. When people buy or sell their house, it's an emotional purchase. I don't know if any of you have bought or sold recently, but um, when I'm working with sellers and they're ready to sell their house and I tell them they should get rid of their family photos and they should, by the way, the house smells bad because of the pets and um, we need to paint the color here. You got to say it really nicely because they love their house. They painted it that weird mustard color because they think it's beautiful. Um, they don't smell their pets and they want Bozo to be there to meet the clients. You have to tread lightly. They love their house. They think it's better than anybody else's house in the neighborhood, even though the one down the street is twice the size and updated and totally new kitchen. But they think theirs is worth more because they love it. You will also uh, find that people walk into a house and they make their decision as soon as they walk in the front door. They don't have to see the whole house. They, they know if it's their house or not. Uh, there's a phrase in real estate called buyers are liars. And they don't mean to be. They think they know what they want, but emotion takes over. And a couple years ago, uh, they didn't give me much information as far as what they wanted. Uh, they asked to see one house in particular, and I think that was listed for like 980. So I knew that was a price range, but they wouldn't commit to a price range. They did tell me two towns on opposite, uh, opposite sides of the metro area that they wanted to look at. Other than that, nothing. Oh, uh, nice woodwork and a, a yard big enough for a pool. It's hard to look up nice woodwork in MLS because there's no button that says three bedrooms, nice woodwork. Um, I showed them some properties and then in the other second neighborhood, the second day I was showing them properties, there were very few properties to show. There just wasn't much for sale. This was several years ago. And I showed them a one-story house based on the, they did tell me how big their previous house had been. They hadn't told me if they wanted it bigger or smaller, but because this was a one-story, it was definitely smaller than their older house. Um, it had a pretty small yard, not big enough for a swimming pool. Uh, it did have nice woodwork, but I said, Hey, there's not a whole lot of houses to show, but let's go see this one. It's brand new. It's the builder, builder model. Let's go see it. Walk in the front door. Totally in love. I'm like, seriously, this is not what you told me you wanted. You know why they fell in love with it? It was a builder model. The builder staged it with really nice furniture. The house was, I can't remember. I think it was right under a million dollars. Um, the builder had used the same living room furniture and the same dining room furniture that they had in their current home. So they walked in and it felt like home. That's why they bought the property. We closed in a week. I got a huge paycheck two days before Christmas, two days of showing them properties. People are crazy. Sometimes crazy in a good way, sometimes crazy in a bad way. All right. So here's some of the necessary skills that you have to have in order to do this. You have to have some patience. People make decisions on their own timeline. They do think they know everything because of HGTV. You have to explain to them the truth. Um, you have to understand that this is an emotional purchase for them. They may tell you what they want in a house and then they don't like any of the houses you show them just like that because they don't really know what they like until they see it. Um, they don't know what they're doing for the most part. Most people don't buy houses that often. So you do have to have some patience and explain the process to them. Um, uh, and you have to walk them through it. You have to be able to do sales. You have to have flexibility. You have to be able to change up what you're doing that day if somebody suddenly needs you because there's a house hitting the market at 4 p.m. today and it's gonna be have offers on it by 5 p.m. Um, you have to be able to 
figure out plans of, okay, my buyer says they can only afford this much and wants a house in this neighborhood, but that's not going to happen. So let me think about how I can help them get something else, either flexibility and figuring out how to get them better financing or flexibility, how to figure out how to get them some gift money or some grants or a different neighborhood that's going to meet their needs um, that they haven't even heard about. So you have to be able, not every project is the same you have to be trustworthy. You have fiduciary responsibility to your clients. You are handling their money. You are handling uh, the biggest purchase of their lives. You are signing legal contracts. Not only are you explaining contracts to your client and asking them to sign them, you're signing them also. So you need to be completely trustworthy, completely ethical, um, completely willing to find out the answer if you don't know the answer to make sure that you're giving the right answers to your clients, okay? And when you're new, there are gonna be all kinds of times you're not gonna know the answer. Figure out a way to tell your clients, I'll get back to you on that and go find the right answer. You have to be trustworthy. You have to have people willing to, um, to trust you when they're spending that kind of money. You have to be an educator. Uh, as I said, most people don't sell homes very often. They don't buy homes very often. You have to tell them the process. I've had clients that, that come to me with stuff and they ask me to do things and I just look at them like, oh, last time they sold a home was 30 years ago. Things were different back then. <laughs> so you have to teach them about it. Um, as I mentioned, you have to be ethical. And it's funny, on a, a, a Facebook page a little while ago popped up a uh, question uh, from a realtors across the country. What do you wish you knew before you got into this business? And the most common answers that came back, I wish I knew I was going to be a marriage counselor. I wish I knew I was going to be a family therapist. <laughs> because most people who buy a house are not single. There are single people who buy houses, but most people, they're part of a family one way or another, whether it's a couple or somebody and kids, and everybody has to agree. And by the way, some of the worst things are when you have a young couple go look at houses with you forever, and they finally found one, and then they say, dad wants to see the house. The deal's shot. If dad shows up to see the house, he's just going to have to find problems with it. So you have to work with them how to handle their family how to uh, figure out what their wants are versus their needs. And you have to deal with all their personality types in there. So that goes back to patience also. But yeah, you have to work with whole families sometimes. You also have to have some good tech skills. I've been working with an agent for over a year now. She, um, she thinks she knew real estate before because her family owned a lot of commercial properties. Um, I don't know how old she is. I'm blaming it on her age. It's not fair, I suppose. She, some of the technology doesn't compute with her. Some of it she's great at, other parts of it does not compute. MLS is your multiple listing service. That is a computer website that you are going to go to all day, every day. And that's where you look up houses. And that's where you um, uh, figure out the price for the house that you're gonna list tonight. And that's where you look at all the pictures and figure out which ones you're going to take your clients to. You spend your life on MLS. You have to enter listings into there. You have to know how to use it. You have to know how to do searches. You have to know how to run statistics off of it. There are separate statistical programs that you know how, have to know how to use. And of course, you will have an app for that on your phone also. Um, even lockboxes run from an app from your phone. So if you want to open a lockbox on a house, you have to have the app on your phone. Showing time is the service. Uh, there are a few of them, but showing time uh, is for the area. When you set up your appointments, you don't call another agent and say, hey, can I show your house at noon? No, you go online and you set up the appointments online. You have to click the right buttons. You have to know how to do it. You've got an app for that. Uh, when you're working with sellers, you have to teach your sellers how to use it because they're going to get text messages or they can go to the app to accept an appointment or decline an appointment. So you have to be able to work with your sellers and teach them a little bit about how it's going to work. Um, RPR, that just stands for Realtor Property, Realtors Property Resource. That's something put out by the National Association of Realtors. And that's another database of property information. And you can look at plat maps there. Do you even know what a plat map is yet? Um, you can look at the history of properties there. You can get some fantastic school information from there. But it's another computer program you have to learn. Of course, you have to know GPS because you got to get around to places. Um, transaction desk or zip forms. These are two different brand names of how you're going to do your contracts. You don't take a piece of paper and write on it and fill it out. 
you go online and you fill it out online and then you have to figure out how to organize the pages online and then you have to send it to your client and they will sign it online and they will get it back to you. And then you have to look it over and you have to sign it and then you have to get it off to the other agent and then they have to get it back to you after their clients sign it. Uh, HomeSnap is another app on your phone. And by the way, Transaction Desk is also on your phone. Um, HomeSnap is another app on the phone. It's not a necessary one, but a lot of your clients have it. It's a great way to get your clients lo loyal to you. It's uh, an app you can send to them and they snap photos of houses that they like. And of course, you're going to be on your phone texting all the time. So if you don't know how to use apps, if you're not good with a smartphone yet, you got to be good with it because you will be on it all day, every day. Um, I've got uh, five or six real estate apps on here um, in one little section and I have to use them all the time. So um, if you're not tech savvy, you're going to need to work on a team or get tech savvy. All right, let's talk a little bit about money. Um, most people, as I mentioned at the beginning, most people think that realtors make a ton of money. Some do, but your money goes places. So not only are you an independent contractor generally, so you have to pay for your own car and pay for your own car insurance. Uh, most people, not most people, I don't know what the percentages are, but it used to be that you would always put a buyer in your car when you went out looking at properties. You drive them around, it's a great time to talk to them, stuff like that. Even before COVID, fewer and fewer people were actually driving their clients or mostly meeting them at houses. But it's tough if you're going to go see five or six houses. But my car insurance company made me have higher in car insurance because I was transporting somebody in my car for a business purpose. Um, you have to buy your own computer, you have to buy your own phone, you have to pay your own um, MLS fees, you have to pay your own phone service fees. So there's a lot of money that comes out of your commission check that if you've used to use working in an office, you never thought about before. The general public hears how much commission agents make, okay? Every time the listing agent makes a contract with the seller, and that's where the commission is determined. And that commission is always negotiable. There's no standard fee. There's no broker that sets the fee that you have to charge. It is always negotiable between the listing agent and the seller, okay? Uh, so it depends on the market that you're in. Sometimes it's 6%, sometimes it's 7%. Sometimes it's different depending on um, if they're friends and family. It's, it's always flexible, flexible. But let's just go with 6% right now, just to put a number out there. Of that 6% that the listing uh, that the seller is going to pay to the listing agent's broker. Technically, it goes to the broker. The broker keeps part of that, okay? It, maybe they're on that 50% split. Maybe they're on a 70-30 split. The broker keeps 30% and the agent gets 70. But that 6% gets split to your broker already. And then you also, if you're that listing agent, you have to pay the agent who brings the buyer in and their broker. So you may charge your seller 6%, you may keep 3% of that, but then your broker gets part of that. And the other 3% goes to the buyer and the uh, buyer's agent. And that buyer's agent has to give some to their broker. Plus then you have to pay all your expenses out of it. So the amount of money that the agents get is split four ways right from the beginning. Not four equal ways, but there's four people looking for money right from the beginning. Okay. So we make less than people think that we do, which means you need to calculate if you can afford to do this or not. Let's take an example here. So median sale price for a single family home. This means a detached home, not a condo or a townhome. So it's pretty high, um, uh, 1,225,000, okay? So if you're working as a buyer's agent, let's see there's a listing for this price, the median price, and I bring a buyer in. Now, usually the seller agent keeps more than half of that commission. Not always, usually they keep more than half. So if that 6%, most buyer's agents in the, in the area pay out about 2.5%. And by the way, that will be listed in MLS when you're working with your buyers and taking it out, taking them out. So if I'm working as the buyer's agent, I'm going to get paid uh, 0.2 or 2.5% of the purchase price. Okay. Listing agent's going to keep the higher amount. I'm going to get 2.5%. Uh, uh, so if we do that math, then my commission would be $30,000, 625. Okay. Great. Sounds like a lot of money. Just sell a couple houses a year, I'm done. But then my broker is going to take their split. Let's say I'm working for a broker who takes 45%. Okay, so they're going to take almost $14,000 of my $30,000. And that leaves me with $16,844. Still a lot of money. If 
if the buyer was easy and they bought a house pretty quickly. <laughs> sometimes they're not easy. And sometimes they look at a million houses. Right now you're writing lots and lots of purchase agreements for each buyer before they actually win the bidding war. But you can see how it seems like, you know, people hear 6%. Oh, 6% of 1.2 million. That's, that's a ton of money. No, you don't end up with that. And now not every broker is going to split you 45%. Okay, this is just an example to show you that it could be a lot lower, but then you still have to pay all your own expenses out of that. Okay, so you need to figure out, um, usually when uh, coaches are talking to you about how you earn money, how you figure out what you need to uh, make, you work backwards. What are all your expenses? What do you need to take home? And then figure out how many transactions you have to do. Here's some of your annual fees. Every year you have to pay the national association fees. You have to pay your state association. You have to pay your local association. You have to pay the government to keep your license up to date. Oh, actually, um, actually that's a bad fee. I shouldn't have told you every, uh, every year because that's actually, um, you have to renew every four years. So divide that one by four. So I'm off on that. Sorry about that. Um, you have MLS fees. You pay to use that MLS service. And every year that equals $768 in San Francisco. Um, you have to pay for your lockbox fee, that electronic lockbox, it costs money. E and O insurance, that stands for errors and omissions insurance. Um, and that figure is probably too low, uh, but you pay an insurance company in case you get sued and they can cover you for it. So it's a business insurance that you have to have. And then also every four year cycle, again, your license renews every four years, you have to pay for education. So, um, and I just uh, pulled off the rates at uh, Kaplan schools. Kaplan schools is one of the places that offers um, uh, education for um, real estate, continuing education and pre-licensing. And I took the their package for the four years and divided it by four to get that. So I'm off by a little bit because um, the license fee but you can see that, that your annual fees are already quite a bit of money there before you've even sold a house. So for those of you who are thinking, well, I'll just hang on my license for the next 10 years and not sell a property, you are losing some money each year. Okay. All right. So what's your day look like? Again, up to you. Some people will set an appointment uh, schedule. I'm going to read for the first hour business news and then I'm going to return phone calls and then I'm going to go out on appointments and then I'm going to return phone calls at a certain time in the afternoon, whatever. You can set up your day and it will get ruined by somebody calling you up and needing something right away. But some of the things you do, I've mentioned working for a buyer versus working for a seller. They can be different. Most people recommend trying to work with sellers. And the reason for that is that you make more money with less running around for sellers, right? You list a house and you set it up for sale. And that's a lot going on for that. When you list a house, I'm uh, listing one on Thursday um, and I will go out to the property. I will spend a long time there measuring it. I will take all kinds of information about the house. What kind of floors, what kind of dishwasher, do they have central air? All the details that are gonna go into MLS. Then I spend time writing up a nice little description for it. I hire the photographer to go out there or do my own photographs to get it ready to go. I won't hire a stager for this house. It's a tiny little house, but sometimes you have to hire the stager. You have to put a sign in the yard and your company may charge you to put that sign in. I have to get a lockbox on it. A lot of stuff goes into just getting it ready for sale, but then you get to sit back and let buyer's agents bring their buyers in. Okay. And in a normal market, you may be able to sit back for two or three weeks until you find the right buyer, until the right buyer comes in and then you help your seller negotiate. And then after the negotiations, then you have to work to, to get it toward closing. Where the buyer's agents are, okay, I've got Thursday night free, the kids are playing softball, I can disappear. And you drive a buyer around, go show them four or five houses and you talk to them all night and you get home exhausted. Um, and you may do that with buyers for a couple of months before they find the right house. So most people, advise you to work with the seller more often because you can maybe make some uh, more money that way. Uh, but I just got a, a couple of questions right here. May as well talk about one question says, do you pay for staging or do the client does the client uh, that can depend. Unfortunately, what happens sometimes is you pay for staging, you pay for photos, you pay for the drone photos, all this stuff. And then the client fires you a month later and you've lost all the money. You never got a commission. We're on hundred percent commission here. Okay. That's another reason why it's easy to get into the business because any broker will hire you because they don't have anything to risk. Um, so some people will pay for it. Other times they will ask the client to pay for it up front and they will reimburse it to them at closing. So it doesn't put you at risk um, because some staging, if you've got a big house, can be worth a lot of money. 
So that's one thing that you can ne negotiate. Um, somebody asked where I got my E&O insurance quote from. That was one of my quotes uh, that I paid a previous year. I just haven't checked on it uh, recently. Um, so that that's why I said the 350 on my errors and omissions insurance is probably wrong. It's from a prior year. Okay. Um, so some of the things you're doing is you're working on contracts. You're putting together all that paperwork and there's a lot of paperwork for every contract. Um, you're out showing houses, which can be, as I said, a lot of fun, but it can get exhausting. <clears throat> um, you have to be organized. You have to figure out the best route. You have to figure out how long it's going to take you at each one. Um, if you're working with buyers, you have to be in touch with their loan officers, making sure they're getting approved. You have to talk to the other agent. If you've got a contract in the works, you have to make sure you're in touch with the other agent all the time. Is your end going right? Are we going to close on time? Is this done? Your clients are calling you. Your buyers will need inspections. Some of your sellers will need inspections. Um, an appraisal has to be done on every house that has a loan on it. You have to coordinate with the photographers. You have to get your advertising done. You have to continue to prospect. So even though you're working with all these people that already have contracts and you're trying to work with them, you still have to keep that advertising and the prospecting going. Um, you have to talk to the title company and get that scheduled. The title company is where the closing happens, where the, where the exchange of money for keys happens. But usually buyer and seller both have to schedule the time to be out there. The Both agents have to schedule it. Now, these days, of course, uh, they don't even want everybody to be there at the same time. So it's a little bit easier to um, <laughs> to schedule it because not everybody's going to be there at the same time. But in the past, you try to schedule it where these four busy parties could all be there at the same time. Um, when you're a listing agent, you got to get a lockbox on the house. You got to put the signs out. A lot of agents give gifts to their clients. A lot of times there are brochures at the properties. Um, you have to write up and negotiate offers. And sometimes negotiations go late into the night. And sometimes they take over days when people are going back and forth. I'll give you an extra $10,000 if you throw in the pool table, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. Um, and do a CMA. That's a comparative market analysis. That is where you sit down generally on the seller side and take a look at the house and say, okay, what's it worth? Let me spend an hour or so on MLS and go back and forth and see what it's worth. Okay. Okay. Uh, Here's a couple of bits of information about how you get started. So every state has their own rules, um, but you need 135 hours of education from an approved school. Uh, 45 hours are called real estate principles. 45 hours are called real estate practices. Another 45 hours of uh, legal aspects um, that you have to take. And then you have to, you don't have to take an exam prep course, but a lot of the places teach you an exam prep course that kind of give you after you've taken these two and a half weeks, three weeks of classes, um, they uh, will prep you a little bit more for the exam. Now, here's something to think about. Getting into the business, I say, has a low bar, right? You take a test and you pass and you're in. You don't have to buy inventory or anything like that. But you do have to have time to take these classes. At least now that they're all online, it's a lot easier. It used to be that you'd have to show up for class for a couple of weeks and not do your regular job. Um, keep in mind also that the day you get your license, if you sold a house that day, you're probably still waiting a good month and a half for a paycheck. But most people don't sell a house in the first couple of months because you haven't gotten up to business yet and it takes people a while to get things done. But when you put a purchase agreement on a house, this is what, May 2nd, 3rd, something like that. If I was working with a buyer today and we put an offer in on a house, there's a good chance it wouldn't close till the end of June because title work has to be done and Moving vans have to be hired and appraisals have to be done and the loan process has to go through. And so you're usually, the end of the following month is usually when properties close and you don't get a paycheck until they close, okay? So when you're starting out, you do have to be able to plan for several months with no paycheck, all right? Uh, you have to pass a test with only a 70% or higher. If you're a good test taker, you're golden. If you're a bad test taker, spend some time studying. Uh, you have to be 18 years or older. You have to be a U.S. citizen. Um, and you a background check is required, and you are required to get fingerprinted. Then every four-year cycle, you need 45 hours. Um, and you'll have classes in ethics agency, and that's who you represent. Trust fund handling, that's the um, money that gets put down, the earnest money gets put down. Fair housing. I keep mentioning uh, federal guidelines. The Fair Housing Act of 1968 is an anti-discriminatory uh, discrimination act. And you do have to be careful to make sure that you don't by accident discriminate. There's the, you take these classes 
every four years to make sure that you are understanding the ethics and that you understand fair housing and that you understand risk management. Risk management has a lot to do with um, uh, keeping things confidential. Uh, before the risk management courses were required for us, I never had a, a lock on my a password for my computers or my cell phone. Nobody else touches them. I don't need a lock. You know what? You do need a password. Okay, so 45 hours of education do every year. But the pre-licensing to get your license, you're starting out with 135 hours, all right? All right, quick little bit of information on appraising. Uh, more people are realtors than appraisers. It's a totally different job. <clears throat> it's still real estate. So if you like real estate, but you don't like people, this is your job, <laughs> okay? This is the much more logical side. As I mentioned, when you're working with buyers and sellers, they panic, they cry, they're needy a lot of times, um, but they're also incredibly joyful a lot of times, which is a lot of fun, but they're emotional. Um, uh, on the other hand, when you um, are working in appraising, you are the more logical side. You are not working with the clients. Your client is the bank. Your client is the loan officer. So they're business people. They're not working nights and weekends, so you can make your schedule a little bit better. Um, but you're going in and looking at the property itself and you're looking, comparing it to other properties and you're taking statistics and working off of uh, um, statistical information and futures and things like that. So it's, a, it's, it's more solitary. You work by yourself and you get to spend more time at your computer working by yourself, working at home, and you don't have any panicked phone calls at uh, you know, 2 a.m. because your loan officer is not working then either. So it's very differently, um, definitely a different personality type. Most um, appraisers don't really talk to other people very much. <clears throat> you have more control over your schedule. You, oops, uh, more control over your um, clients that you accept. Every order that they send you, you can reject if you want. The problem is it's much tougher to get into the business than it is into real estate. You still need education, you need 150 hours to get in. And these classes can cost up to $2,000 easily. And your license, even just to be a trainee is 950. The problem is that after the last housing crash, uh, they made it much tougher on appraiser trainees. And so almost nobody is willing to take on a trainee anymore. You have to work with a certified appraiser for at least six months a thousand hours, you can't claim you got a thousand hours in in three months and that you're ready to move on. Uh, so a lot of people are there for a year or more working um, as a trainee. You still get paid as a trainee, usually not very much. It's a, a deal you work out with your mentor. Um, but after the last housing crash, they made it very difficult for people to have trainees. I used to have trainees under me and now it's not worth it anymore. Um, I mentioned family business in in when you're a realtor, when you're an appraiser, it's very much a family business these days. I teach uh, some of the pre-licensing courses for appraisers, the ones to get their licenses. Last couple of years, I have maybe seven people in class and that's it. And we only run the class a couple of times a year. And I always go around and ask them, okay, so why are you here? What kind of job are you leaving? And do you already have a mentor? Almost everybody already has a mentor because they shouldn't spend that kind of money on the classes until they do. And almost all of them are working for family. They're the only ones who are willing to take you on as a trainee. So if you want to become an appraiser, it's a great job, but you need to figure out your mentor beforehand before you spend all that money on the classes and the training. Um, <clears throat> it's uh, harder to get into the business, much more training than in real estate training. But um, again, it can be a very good business. Oh, somebody said, can you explain why it's not worth taking on a trainee? Sorry. <clears throat> yes. So years ago, uh, one of my trainees worked in the opposite side of the metro as I did. So it was great. I, he worked with me. He came with me on every appointment uh, up until I knew he knew what he was doing. And then he could do appointments on his own. As an appraiser, you go out to a house, you spend some time measuring, photographing, taking all the notes, everything about that house. You drive around and see what the other houses are like that you're going to compare it to, your comps. And then you go back and work on the report. After I knew he was capable of doing the visits himself, then he could do every visit on that side of town. And then we would work on the report over the phone together and, and I would review his report. But after the last uh, housing crash, they made it so the uh, mentor had to go on every appointment. Well, if I'm going on every appointment with you and then also helping you with every report, why am I paying you? 
So it, it made it so that it, um, most people will not take on trainees anymore. Okay. They are trying to back off that, uh, and some of the regulation on that has backed off, but some of your clients have not backed off on it. They still want the, the mentor to go on every single uh, appointment, and so that's why it's tougher there. Thanks for asking the question. All right. Let me see. All right. Okay. So, um, by the way, I've got the next slide will give you... Um, lots of links to uh, the National Association, the San Francisco Association, the California Association, uh, how, where you get take your exams. And some of the exams will be delayed right now because of COVID and uh, fewer uh, places, oops, uh, fewer people taking them at a time. All right, I talked pretty quickly. I talked for quite a while. Any questions that you have about it? Any things that you've heard? Any rumors that you've heard? Anything that... Um, you're curious about, feel free to ask. Oh, how about property management? Oh, um, uh, there, property management is, uh, you still need a real estate license for some property management and for rental stuff. Property management is a whole different deal. <clears throat> I do have a friend who works in property management and he manages big properties or small properties. They take a percentage each month and every contract is different as far as what they handle. He's got a great uh, staff of handymen and or handy people <laughs> so that um, he takes the burden off of the homeowners. Right now, I, I own one rental property and it's just a small condo and my tenant is great. So I don't need somebody like him, but I have people texting me every single day trying to buy it because rents are going up also. And so a lot of people own a lot of rental properties and they do need to, um, they do need to have management so that they can go on vacation and get out of there. All right. Um, let's see. Let's see. Got some other questions down here. Oh, so someone says from census, California lost population. What is residential advantage as during pandemic 2020 families migrated to second tier cities? Um, yes, a lot of people have moved various places um, and gotten out of metro areas. I have a friend who moved out of the state, didn't tell his employer, and his employer is telling people they have to come back to work in the summer. <laughs> He's got to figure out how to tell his employer that. I mean, it is changing where people live. Uh, Texas, the Texas market is going crazy also. The Texas market is definitely skyrocketing in prices, and people are fighting for houses there also. Um, I don't know what's going to happen in commercial real estate. It's funny, right near my house, they're building light rail to get to downtown. Downtown doesn't really exist anymore. I don't know if they need the light rail anymore. It's been in process for years. And I don't know if the commercial property is going to come back. Um, you know, every time something good happens, something bad happens to somebody else. Uh, and maybe it'll come back eventually, but maybe not for a few years. So I don't know exactly what's going to happen to commercial. If you want to buy a commercial property, you can probably get a darn good deal. Okay. Yeah, Texas as a non-disclosure state, I don't know how people work there. As a non-disclosure state, it means that um, you don't know what a house sold for. I can look up, you know, in the tax records what something sold for easily. I can look up who the owner is easy. Uh, but in Texas, it's very difficult. Uh, somebody asked about that property management, how to start working for one if you've never done it. I honestly, sorry, I do not know much about property management. Um, I would get a hold of one of the companies because uh, some of them are probably hiring because they probably are taking on more rental properties right now, uh, right? If people are, um, uh, so they might be, I'm sorry, I don't know much, but I would get a hold of someone to ask them. Um, what is considered a fair commission split? That depends on what your broker is offering you, right? I was happy to pay the 45, 50% when I started out because my broker was had an office for me and provided the paper and provided tons of training. But later on, I wasn't willing to pay that because I didn't need that help anymore. So interview brokers, interview other realtors and see what kind of deals they're getting and what they offer and what's important to them. Uh, I worked at 70, 30 for a long time and that was great. Um, uh, what does an appraiser earn on average for each residential appraisal in San Francisco? I do not know the answer to that. Uh, uh, it's hard to say what the average is, plus average has been skyrocketing during this uh, massive movement because there are fewer appraisers out there and we're all swamped. So prices are going up. 
Uh, in some parts of the country, they're making $300 in appraisal. I was making that back when I started 20 some years ago. Um, other places, they don't do anything for under $1,000. Um, and of course, they're, I know, I know you asked for an average, but of course, properties are all different. If I've got a simple, simple little house built in 1950, and it's like everything else built in 1950 in the neighborhood, not a problem. But if I've got, you know, property with waterfront and a turret and all kinds of crazy stuff, I'm going to charge them a lot more money. Um, I would guess in San Francisco, it's over a thousand per, um, per order, but that is just a guess. Do you have to get a license for multiple states if you want to do real estate in different states? Absolutely. Some of them are reciprocal licenses where they will let you just take a test and not go all through the education. Um, but a lot of people have licenses in two states where they spend the summers in Florida or uh, the neighboring state, especially if you're near the border of a state. Absolutely. Just every state has different rules on uh, what you do there. How many hours does each appraisal take? Um, the answer to every single appraisal question is it depends. <laughs> um, a simple one, I can be at the house for 20 minutes and knock out the report in a little over an hour. It used to be quicker, but they have a lot more forms in there now um, with probably a half hour to an hour of research. So a couple of hours. Some reports take days because there's a lot of research. There's um, a lot of data that you have to consider. Sometimes there just are not comparable properties. You know, you've got the only two story in a neighborhood of all one stories or a neighborhood of all condos and things like that. Um, I do not hire a staging company for every house. Uh, depends on if the clients have crappy furniture or a nice furniture. It depends on the price range of the house. Um, right now, I'm not going to bother to stage many houses because they're not going to be on the market long enough to even get the furniture in there. Um, uh, I don't even hire a photographer for every single house. A lot of agents do. But again, for the lower income properties, lower housing prices, iPhones are not horrible. Um, but staging, do, it, staging can get very expensive. Sometimes you just stage one or two rooms, but a lot of times the clients have good stuff. You can also hire a stager that doesn't rent you all the furniture, but that goes in and gives a consultation and will tell the clients, move this, take that down, put this rug here, and they don't provide any furniture or anything like that. They just, it's a consultation on how to take the stuff that the client already has and makes it better. All right. Uh, how much time do you take to measure? <clears throat> On a simple house, the quickest I've ever measured a house is 12 minutes. <laughs> Longest it's ever taken me is, I've had a couple of houses that took three hours. And those had indoor swimming pools and indoor golf simulators and indoor sport courts and movie theaters and stuff like that and unusual houses. But I'm at most houses around the 20 minute mark, um, but all that depends on the neighborhood and the kind of house. And how much of the house is fake? I said a house recently. It really was mostly a rectangle, but they had so much build out of goofy little stone walls that weren't part of the house. It was just decorative stuff. So, all right. That is the end of the questions at the moment. So, if anybody has anything else, feel free to drop it in. Otherwise, we may be all set. Oops, one more question. Oh, just a thanks. Uh, okay, you're welcome. <laughs> it was a thank you for you, Zoe. We did a fantastic job despite all the disruptions, and I apologize for that. You did an incredible job. <laughs> <laughs> um, so thanks, thanks so much, and that was an amazing amount of information. I think um, Zoe, didn't you tell me that this is like a six-week course that you just delivered in an hour and a half? <laughs> Uh, no, this, this is not a course that I've ever taught before, but there is a lot of information that I do talk fast. Um, real estate's kind of a complicated business. There's a lot to know. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, Zoe. And again, All right. apologies for that, Packer. And um, we'll see the rest of you at our Everybody, next program. Thanks for participating. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye.